Welcome to the Free Cities Podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to the last episode in my series of recordings from our recent Free Cities trip to Central America. As of next week, I will start posting a new series of conversations recorded amongst the Freedom and Liberty community in Prague in the Czech Republic. Very much looking forward to that one. I had some really excellent conversations over there. Today's chat is with a gentleman by the name of John Dennehy. Now, John is a former journalist who quit his life in the U.S., to move to El Salvador with the intention of starting a Bitcoin education program. The result was the creation of the non-profit organization Mi Primer Bitcoin and the world's first ever Bitcoin diploma. In this conversation, we discuss the story behind My First Bitcoin, as it's called in English, and the current state of the education program, as well as Bitcoin adoption in general in El Salvador. Now, as a firm believer in the notion that Bitcoin is a tool to empower people, John has some strong views on the subject of education, as well as the state of legacy journalism, the world he left to come to El Salvador. I hope you find this discussion interesting and informative. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed if you like our content. And please, leave us a review if you so desire. In the meantime, it just leaves for me to say to you, please sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with John Dennehy. Just introduce yourself and uh, or uh, let me introduce you first and then see if there's anything you want to add to it. Sure. Yeah. So, um, John, this is John. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> looking at Dehany. John Dennehy. Is that uh, is that Irish by any chance? That is Irish. Yes. OK, right. John Dennehy. Um, John's uh, the founder of Me Premier Bitcoin, which is um, an education program in El Salvador. Um, loosely translated as my first Bitcoin. That's what most um, foreigners know it as. Um, so uh, maybe John, can you, if the, unless there's anything you want to add to that, can you can you tell us a little bit about but what it is you're doing? Yeah, sure. Um, so my first Bitcoin is a project that is nearly a year and a half old. It started in 2021 here, and we are focused on getting people off of zero here in El Salvador. So the target demographic for our Bitcoin education classes are Salvadorians who are brand new to Bitcoin. Um, so people who are, we walk them through their first transactions, you know, we, we just try to give them the basics to introduce them to the world of Bitcoin. Um, and we try to do that in a way that's as interactive as possible. When you say get them off zero with Bitcoin, do you mean get them some Bitcoin or do you mean get them off zero with Bitcoin education? Well, both. We try to we try to pair uh, giving away some satoshis with education. So the way that that works in our intro classes is part of the class. So this is just a one-off, ninety-minute class. Part of the class involves the student downloading a, a Lightning wallet, and we send them the the teacher will send them some sats. They'll send it to the next student. You know, we'll make a little chain like that so they get to practice sending and receiving. And they keep the sats at the end. You know, it's a, it's a small amount, but it's something that they get to hold on to at the end. Right. I I need to clarify a couple of things because I'm almost certain people are going to be going, Lightning Wallet? Sats? <laughs> so maybe you could explain um, the, what those two terms mean. Sure, sure. When I, when I say Lightning Wallet, I, I mean a Bitcoin wallet. But some Bitcoin wallets um, allow, to, allow you to use Lightning and some don't. So... We, here in El Salvador, we primarily use Lightning, which is 
uh, layer built on top of Bitcoin. It's still Bitcoin, but it's a way to use Bitcoin that is faster and cheaper than using it on chain, which is the primary way that people use it here. And your definition of sats, that's something a lot of people won't have come across as well. You'd be surprised. I know what it's like in the in the world of Bitcoin. You, you We throw these terms around, but yeah. um, I, I'm off, I have to keep reminding myself to, to, to sort of like explain almost everything as I go. Yeah. Yeah. So sats is, is short for satoshis. So that's the smallest unit of measurement in Bitcoin. So there's 100 million satoshis in one Bitcoin. So one Satoshi is, it's essentially a penny, right? It's actually worth much less than a penny, but it's the lowest unit of measurement. Same principle as pennies to the pound or, yeah. what is it, dimes to the dollar? No, what what was the... I guess it would be dimes to the dollar, I but don't that's know. not a... <laughs> and, and, and just so that people understand, Satoshi, Satoshi's the, the pseudonymous uh, creator of Bitcoin. Yes. So we call him Sats in, in, in honor of him. Yes, um, correct. So, so I, ca- I came to the um, graduation ceremony a couple of days ago. That yes. was f- such uh, fun. We even managed to, we were part of the testing process of the students at the end. C- can you talk a little bit about the actual, um, what, how much work they have to do, how long it takes? Um, and, you know, it, it seemed like it was, a pretty, it was a pretty important day for them on graduation day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so we... we do a variety of different things. You know, I mentioned the, the intro class, these one-off classes, but we also have developed a Bitcoin diploma, which is a 10-week program that we started um, in April of this year in a public school here in El Salvador. And uh, now we're in a few public schools. We're also running it out of some mayor's offices and just some community centers, um, just a variety of places that we're in now. But it's a 10-week program. So the first three weeks, our basic financial literacy. What is money? Why is money? How did we arrive at this moment? What What is the system and what are parts of the system that maybe could be improved? And then in week four, then we get into Bitcoin. Um, let's, let's do a, a bit of what is money then. I, I, that, I think that's amazing because I didn't ask myself that question until I was in my late 40s. And it was a complete and utter um, surprise to me. Not only that I'd never actually decided to ask myself that question, um, but but that it was it seemed like it was so important to know, right? So what must it be like? How old are these students that we're talking in your on your diploma? Uh, so it, it it depends where it's being hosted, but when it's in the public school system, then sixteen years old, seventeen years right. old. Right. So I want to know what it's like. To, to learn about money as a 16-year-old then? Now, what kind of response do you get from, from, from kids? So we, we actually, I'm always amazed at how quickly they could grasp it. So the, the first page of the workbook is a blank page with a question at the top that says, why Bitcoin? And they fill it out before, before the first class even begins. And for the most part, they leave it blank. You know, maybe they add a sentence or two there. Uh, and then a- after the last class, then there's actually three pages that are blank with the same question, why Bitcoin? And there are, there are times where students don't have enough room, where they, where they staple another page on to, to get that fourth or fifth page in. Um, so at, at the start, people don't know what money is, which would be the same for me. When I was 16 or 17, I didn't know what money was. I never thought about it. It was actually... It wasn't until around the time when when I first heard about Bitcoin that that I started to really question that, Um, which I think is one of the great things about Bitcoin, right, is it makes you question things that you took for granted before. And and what is money is, is, uh, you know, at the top of that list. So, okay then. Well, no, I was going to ask you what is money, but what I was interested to know, did you ever get any unusual or unexpected answers from from young El Salvadorians about, you know, that question, why Bitcoin? 
did obviously they learn why Bitcoin, but did you ever did you learn anything from the? This is the second year you've done it. So in the first year, did you did it open your eyes to any any things that you may not have thought of before, or, or any new angles, or how it how it may you know affect a, a local a young Salvador El Salvadorian differently to someone else in another country? Um, I think El Salvador is a really special place just because the, the context is different here compared to anywhere else just because of the fact that it's legal tender here. So it is quite normal to use Bitcoin here, even though it's it's still a minority of the population. But, you know, just walking around, you'll see signs, Bitcoin accepted here, all over the place. Uh, so, it's, so it's kind of part of the fabric of life here. So that changes the context. I think Bitcoin is already something real to people here whereas in a different place and i think there's another it, it's just a longer bridge they have to cross but here people accept it bitcoin is a thing there was early on there was an issue where people very closely associated bitcoin with the government here um, that has mostly gone away where people recognize that that these are two different things but it persisted for for quite a while where people thought that that the Salvadorian government was involved in the creation of Bitcoin or the development of Bitcoin or, or that they had, they had a strong influence over the protocol. Um, so, um, without giving, well, no, you, I don't think it matters to give too much away, but um, how, how do you teach 15-year-old, um, 16-year-old Salvadorians what is money then? What's the, uh, you know, I think a lot of people would actually find that quite, quite useful. Mm-hmm. especially if you've never asked yourself that question before mm-hmm. yeah now i'm wishing i brought one of the books did you here. read <laughs> or maybe i should ask you who wrote the syllabus yeah uh, yeah so so maybe that's that's something to to take a step back and and say that so i'm not a teacher right? ah, so all, right. of, all of our teachers are salvadorian all of our teachers are locals to the communities in which they teach um and the people that developed the the curriculum it was a it was a combination of Salvadorians here who already had some experience teaching Bitcoin and also foreigners who had more of a a deeper pedagogy for for lesson planning and all that. So we tried to combine those two those two strengths, people on the ground here who had experience with Salvadorians and people who had deep experience with developing curriculum. Uh, so so it was a, an international team. So, you, so you, um, I was going to say you're not qualified to answer that question. What is Bitcoin? I, I won't embarrass you and, and give you a shot unless you want to, because I know I, I would, I know wholeheartedly that I know what is money. But then I would probably ramble on for 25 minutes <laughs> talking about rye stones and <laughs> and nonsense like that. But um, um, okay, let's talk about. Uh, the, so that's the beginning of the curriculum. What is money? Why Bitcoin and what is money? And how does it evolve from there yeah so we try to touch on on all the different aspects of bitcoin so there's uh five classes then that are on bitcoin there's a class on on lightning and which again is is this layer that's built on top of bitcoin that makes it um, a little bit easier to use for everyday transactions and part of that is there's a way to quote unquote run your own node which is to help support the network and help process transactions and all that. So so we talk about how to set up a node and then Bitcoin mining, what is mining, what, what does that mean, how does that support the network. We go into the differences between centralization and decentralization, so some of the philosophical aspects of Bitcoin. Um, and then in the, in the last chapter, then it talks a bit more specifically about El Salvador, you know, just to have the context of, of a country that has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender and the future. So what what are things that could happen into the future, not just for Bitcoin or El Salvador, but also for them as individuals, because we want the the goal is to end the program. But the students continue on, they continue on either learning on their own or in in some cases continue on with us. Right. Some some students then join the project afterwards. They become teachers. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but at the at the graduation on Saturday in Itaco, then there were some students from the first graduation, from the first generation there, that were verifying, which is you know, and proctor in the the exam for the new generation of students. I don't, 
Right, they were. They were very vocal as well, weren't they? Yeah. I didn't know they were former students. I, I just assumed they were working for you guys. But they're, yeah, uh, yeah. it seemed like a really close-knit bunch of, of friends. You know, are there, there good relationships forged during that course? Yeah, yeah, for sure. In fact, one of those people, um, and maybe a second one, but definitely one of them, is going to teach our Bitcoin diploma in that school next year for us. So, so they're graduating high school this month. And when high school goes back into session in January next year, then they'll, then they will be working for us and they'll be teaching their younger peers. And is it only at that one place currently at the one school, the Bitcoin diploma in the public school system? Oh, it's, it's throughout. No. So, so we are right now and maybe uh, just to, just, just to show the growth of the, the Bitcoin diploma, uh, we started, so we're in our third group of students. So every 10 weeks we have a, we have a new group. Uh, the first, the first group was in one school, 38 graduates. The second group was two schools, 94 graduates. And currently the Bitcoin diploma is being run in three public schools, two mayor's offices, and two community centers. So you're, with, with uh, maybe there'll be 250 or so graduates this this 10 week session. And how are you deciding where and when to roll it out? I, I take it this isn't something you've done. This is a, a private enterprise, is it? It's not, is it something you've done uh, along with the with the government? I suppose if it's public, the public school system, or is it something you, you've you've done privately? Uh, yeah. So so the government is. They they open by accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. They they've opened the door for innovation, right? In in, and I think this is an example of the sort of innovation that that allows. Um, but yeah, this this was an independent initiative. So and so, how do you get to decide where you can take it? You just approach a school and say, look, we'd like to offer this. And- We've actually never approached anyone. So we have a backlog of people that want to receive this program. So it's about getting enough teachers, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, you know, every 10 weeks, we more than double the the number of locations and the number of students served. And that is something that we want to continue next year. Uh, so we are actively thinking of, of how to scale this. And we are teaching enough teachers so so next year when we start the first 10 week class we plan to have at least 500 students and in the next 10 weeks at least a thousand students in the next 10 weeks at least 2,000 students and that's just in the in the bitcoin diploma most of our students are not diploma students most of our students are just intro students which are just one-off classes uh we've had about 10,000 of those this year Uh, we had 400 last year 10,000 so far this year and who who pays for the do this do the students have to pay does the school pay do you offer it for free or? yeah so we one of our core philosophies is that bitcoin is for everyone so in order for that to be true then it has to be free we can't introduce any barriers to entry so the so the classes are always free um, we have thought about doing more advanced technical classes which would be paid classes but we haven't started that yet and and for the intro classes, you know, the, the main focus of what we're doing is getting people off zero. Those classes will always be free. And in fact, as I mentioned, there's some some sats, some some very small amount of money that, that they actually walk away with. So the way that all of this is funded is effectively through donations. So it's either individual donations or, or sponsors, right? We have sponsors. I just kind of lump them together because it's it's people um, donating money, whether it's an individual or, or it's, a, it's a business. or And it, what's the long-term goal here? I, I would imagine, because this is an experiment even in the, the nation of El Salvador, the Bitcoin experiment, and I would imagine that if, if the um, adoption continues, this is the kind of thing that you could export to other countries almost very easily once because there is no Bitcoin curriculum. You know, we, we learn from podcasts and YouTube videos on the whole. But so I take it this is the first example of an actual Bitcoin curriculum. Yeah, as, as far as we know, this is the first of its kind. Um, and, and, and the same the same as here, there's a there's a list of mayors and, and school directors that have contacted us to see if we could 
go to their school or their town or city. Um, it's the same internationally. There's a number of international projects or schools that have contacted us to see if if we could help them roll it out in, in their area. And in fact, um, so this is the third edition of the Bitcoin Diploma of the, of the workbook. So every 10 weeks, we also come out with a new edition. So, so we're, we're just moving as fast as we can with everything. And, and uh, this, this third edition, you know, the first one was we were really under a lot of time pressure. Um, the second one, we didn't, we, we had to edit the second one before the first one was really, before we had feedback from the first one. So it's really the third one is the first time that, that we were able to incorporate feedback into it. And we were confident enough to, to release it to the world, right? So it's been open source now. And anybody in the world could download a PDF. It has, it has everything. It has all the, all the text, but also all the graphics and everything is in there um, for anyone in the world to download for free. And many people have, and some of them have downloaded it, printed it out and taught in their own communities. Like we, we did not organize that. We had nothing to do with that, but people have you know, taking pictures of it or, and just tweeted it to us, stuff like that. So, so it is already being taught internationally. Just out of interest, um, w- w- what kind of feedback did you get? I think that might be interesting to know because essentially you're orange pilling people. And I know everyone has their own problems when they're orange pilling. And I think Bitcoiners are of, often notoriously bad at orange pilling, actually. They get a little bit too overexcited too quickly and spew it all out. So what's been your experience of trying to design uh, an orange pilling method? And what feedback did you get after that first one? Yeah, so um, I think a general feedback is something that we always try to incorporate. And, you know, we're always it's always reinforced with the feedback that more interactive is better. So just things like to demonstrate the coincidence of, of double wants, then there's an activity where people get different slips of paper and they have to trade with their peers. And, and you know, it's like, okay, so this is why we have this common denominator, this, this money in, in, in the center. But, but to explain that with text, it doesn't click as well. So with, with everything we do, we're always striving to be more interactive, to make to make Bitcoin more tangible, to make all of the lessons more tangible. And is the kind of freedom notion of Bitcoin an important part of the syllabus, or are you just teaching? No, it's 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 a big part. the The philosophy of Bitcoin is a big part of the curriculum, and I think that's because it's a that's the main motivator for the all the people working on the project, all the all the staff and volunteers. They're all motivated. They're all mission oriented people who believe that that Bitcoin is is uh, is a force that could change the world for the better. So that's that's definitely, you know, maybe even without meaning to that, that's definitely bled into the curriculum quite a bit. And is that something your average um, El Salvadorian teenager knows about or, or yearns for? I, mean, I never I, the first, I mean, this year is the first time I'd ever come to El Salvador and I I knew nothing about it like most people until the, the, the um, until the Bitcoin law was passed. Um, but but is is it? Did they get that part of it? Uh, you know, I mean, in a, in a way, m- many people who understand that understand the, the a bit more of a macro situation in the world, and you, you're not always that connected in a place like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they they do, and I think you know, talking about you're not always very connected in a place like that. I, I think they see Bitcoin as a way to break down that connection. So one, one way to do that is just at the graduation that you were at, right? You verified you came from, from Europe, or uh, I'm not sure where your last stop was, but you came from a faraway place to help verify that this person could receive their Bitcoin diploma to walk them through those final steps. Uh, and just just that all by itself demonstrates that Bitcoin is much bigger than just here. It's it's much bigger than El Salvador. There's there's people from all over the world who are interested in this, and we we try to foster that in in a lot of different ways. Another way that that we will probably start doing that next term 
is we'll connect, you know, talking about sponsorship. So that, that graduation was sponsored by, by Bitfinex and, and, um, future ones we'd like to, gra- uh, we'd like to sponsor actually from a collection of, of Bitcoiners, individual Bitcoiners, and they could, they could quote unquote sponsor a student and they could connect on Twitter and have a mentor mentee relationship. And that would serve the purpose of also demonstrating that Bitcoin is borderless, right? Which again, goes with the core ethos that we have to show rather than tell whenever possible. And that's a way to, to make the world a little bit bigger for them. Um, you live in El Salvador now, that's right, isn't it? Yes. How long have you been here? Uh, since August of last year. Which is oh, more, so a year and a half? Is yeah. That? And you came here originally. Was the, when was the, um, the legal tender bill passed? Was that? It was passed in, I know it went into effect in September, and I think it was 90 days, so. But after, before you came, so I came, I came after the law was passed before it was implemented. And what, what, what was your intention when you came originally? Oh, I came to do this. Oh, you came to do this, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. You didn't just come as a Bitcoin and to spend some sats and you, you thought, right, this yeah. is a good idea. I mean, I, I thought that, um, you know, this was so, sometimes I think we could forget how crazy the world has been the last few years, right? Because it's like been normalized, but... This was, you know, post pandemic, right? Like pandemic was still, still a thing at the time. And I was, I'm from New York. I was in New York uh, when the pandemic hit there and it was just such a wild place, you know, for so many reasons. Um, but it, but that really made me think deeply about the world um, and that the path that we were on was unsustainable. And uh, I, I really saw Bitcoin as, as a solution, you know, in vague terms, like Bitcoin is something that could put us on the right track again, you know, take us off this track that, that we're on, that's unsustainable, that is going to lead to destruction and put us on something better. And I, you know, that was kind of bouncing around my head. I moved to Ecuador and uh, I previously lived in Ecuador, so I have a lot of friends there and no one knew about Bitcoin. And I was like, oh man, people need to know about Bitcoin here. And I, I actually... Um, paid a couple of people to to teach in their local communities, and it it just didn't really take off. The pandemic was still going on; people didn't want to get together. But then, when El Salvador announced uh, that they were going to make Bitcoin legal tender, then it it kind of clicked. Like, is this have I been moving in this direction without knowing it for for the past year or two? Um, so yeah, I, I I arrived here intending to. I didn't know if Me Premier Bitcoin would succeed. You know, the website, the mission statement was written, the website was, the the name was chosen, the website was there, all that. But uh, I, I, I'm i not a teacher. You know, I, I don't have that background. I just knew that education would be important and maybe there would be a void there. It's funny, I, what, I, I came with, I brought my family here um, uh, earlier in this year for six we stayed here for six weeks and when I left I think I, I, I was tweeting all through my experience you know and the last tweet I put when we were on our way out was that after this whole time here I've realized that education is the single most important thing for for hyper if you believe in hyper bitcoinization it must be education mm-hmm. because at that point I had come across so many misunderstandings yeah. so many um just like you know i i you forget how well informed you can be on bitcoin just in a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. um, that when you come across it kind of out in the wild it's the rumors the misunderstandings that you know it's it's crazy and it really is a very simple thing to get your head around actually you yeah know, and, and 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 the reason for it as well um but but yeah i'm i'm just out of interest then when you so you had an idea you had a name you had a website and you just kind of arrive in a country <laughs> what do you do like what do you go up to the knock on the door knock on someone's door and say hi can i teach <laughs> i've got this new syllabus it's like being a door-to-door salesman with a an education program or something i mean that's that's not too far from, <laughs> from what happened um well, i went to alzante for a week first just because you know I heard so much about Bitcoin Beach and I wanted to 
I wanted to see it for myself. Um, and it, and yeah, Mark, let me just add to that. El Zonte is what we call Bitcoin Beach. It was the original place in which a sort of Bitcoin circular economy was was implemented. How long ago was that? That was quite a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, no, it wasn't. I mean, things move quickly. It was, uh, I want to say, twenty nineteen. It started. Really? Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought it was twenty seventeen. Maybe, maybe twenty eighteen. Right. It could have been 2018, 2019. But it's the, it was the first one in, it, in the world, really, wasn't it? And it became yeah, yeah, no, it was. notable, notor- notorious. And yes, yes. It, it was Bitcoin Beach was the example that I think encouraged El Salvador to adopt it on a, on a nationwide scale. Like, hey, it worked, it worked here. It worked in this town. Let's see if we could make it work for the whole country. So Bitcoin Beach holds a special place in the heart of, of Bitcoiners here. Right. So you turned up at Bitcoin Beach with your suitcase yeah. and your uh, syllabus. And what did they make of that? <laughs> well, um, well I, I didn't spend too much time there. I, I just went to, I was more, I guess, being a tourist when I was there. But I, I moved to San Salvador, which is the capital and the largest city, uh, which is where we are right now. Um, because I figured that would be a strategic place to start. And I pretty literally just talked to every Salvadorian that I came across to get their opinion on Bitcoin and if they would be interested in helping with a Bitcoin education project. So, you know, the 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 teacher in a taco on Saturday at the graduation that you were at, Napoleon, he was my Uber driver the day before legal tender day. Wow. And I, I asked if I could pay with Bitcoin. And he said no, but he was he was curious about Bitcoin, and and you know he had he he had some some base knowledge about it, um, and he was curious to learn more to to talk about it. So, but did he have a history of? T- was he a teacher and an Uber driver? Or? No, no, just he's a phenomenally um, positive yeah, and yeah, smiley, yeah. happy guy, isn't he? I mean, yeah. you literally could feel this presence and the students seem to love him it's like yes. i couldn't believe it when you were shaking their hands how many it was like 50 students was it yeah it was a lot every single one he was like when he saw them <laughs> walking towards the stage he was like <laughs> it was like it was the first time it had ever happened you know and yeah, no, wow so great. he was an uber driver and now yeah. he's what head the head of the head of education or the yes yeah so he's he's uh his story is is a great one um so he was a, he was an Uber driver then, and now this is you know a year and a few months later. This isn't a huge amount of time. He's quit Uber. He has started his own tax, uh, Bitcoin first taxi service. He's a bit driver if you've heard of that. Um, and he actually has has orange pilled some other drivers, some other Uber drivers to effectively work for him when when he when he just has too much going on, he sends somebody else who will accept Bitcoin and, and drive you around. Um, and he's also like this super, super enthusiastic. Um, and just, he, yeah, he's, he's also an amazing teacher and he's, he, yeah, he, he just does it all. <laughs> so I, I haven't heard of bit driver. No. Is that like, it? Is that kind of, um, Uber with Bitcoin or something? Uh, I mean, there's no app, right? So you just have to find him on Twitter or get his WhatsApp or whatever. It's it's a bit more informal than. Oh right, I see. But it, the concept is that, is it? These yeah. are people who will. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people uh, use it for for rides from the airport. I, I mean, I know he's very busy this week because he had that that graduation on Saturday. We have another graduation this Saturday coming up in Opopo, which is another another nearby city. Um, and in between, we he's he's also picking up. I don't know how many people he's picked up. Right, from the so he's driving, still so. driving as well. Yeah, yeah fair he enough. Does, he does it all. Proof of work, right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, so, like, obviously, we're we're at the Free Cities Foundation. We're we're into parallel systems, mm-hmm. um, and I see what you're doing here as a par- as a different form of education. Um, is it? Uh, are you doing it in a different way to regular education or is it just the subject matter that's the kind of the parallel structure? I would say both. Um, you know, the subject matter is, is definitely new and different, but our methods, I believe, are, are also different. I, I'm not, 
I d I'm not very deep into, you know, the pedagogy of the Salvadorian school system here, so I can't, I can't speak too well to that. But, but like, like I said before, that we do have a very strong focus on, on being interactive and actually using Bitcoin. So, so an example of that, we have meetups as well. We have a monthly meetup here in, in San Salvador and also in San Miguel, which is the second largest city in, in the eastern part of the country. Um, that's kind of like our other headquarters for that region of the country. Uh, and at all our meetups, then we give $5 in sats, $5 in Bitcoin to the first 100 people that come. And we talk to the establishment ahead of time and make sure that they accept Bitcoin and that they will have a discount for people that pay with Bitcoin during a, our event. And, you know, we talk to the staff, make sure that, that they're able to handle that and that we, we often give them a class before the meetup to, you know, just give them the basis of, of, of what Bitcoin is and, and how to use it. Um, so the, the point of all that is for people to make, again, the target demographic, and anybody could come, right? So there's plenty of people who are well-versed on Bitcoin that come. But who we're really going after are Salvadorians who are brand new to the space and have maybe never bought anything with Bitcoin. So we're encouraging people to make their first purchase in an environment that is as friendly as possible to do it in. Um, and, and, and that's that's a big part of our philosophy is that the first step is the hardest step. So we try to make that first step as easy as possible. And we try to show rather than tell, you know, like rather than, I mean, obviously when, when we give them the Bitcoin, if, if they're new and they have to download a wallet, then oftentimes we'll sit at their table for 45 minutes just answering questions. It becomes like a mini class. But a lot of people, they don't really get it. They don't have that aha moment with words. They have it with action, right? That, that's, that's, a big, um, that's a big thing that we've noticed and, and that we've tried to lean into. I know from my experience because I um, very the other a uh, few weeks ago just before we left off on this trip, um, we started. I have started a um, a kind of Welsh English version of the Beef Initiative. You know what that is, mm. the thing. On yeah. It. Basically, what that meant was I orange peeled my one of my neighbours. who's a farmer that sells beef, and I actually I think the the her or her moment was. Because she didn't know what Bitcoin was at all. She had no idea. She had literally n no idea at all. All she knew was that I was telling her that if she accepted Bitcoin, there was a huge market of potential customers for her. And um, when I sent her some sats um, on the Lightning Network, I, I just got to download um, a wallet of Satoshi. So, it's, you know, and I sent them and she got them and she was quiet for a couple of seconds. She goes, hold a minute. Um, I didn't sign up for this. How, how did I? How did I get that? You know, mm -hmm. and that was a real. That was even an eye opener for me because I've. That I, you. T I take things like that for granted. Right. But to to see someone in the wild, a very intelligent person, realize and to realize, wow, that's something. That was the most yep. prominent part of what just happened. Was wait a minute. It's like I didn't have to ask someone. I didn't mm -hmm. have to get permission. Yes. I didn't have to. You know. Yes. Really, it is really powerful. And, and one of the things that, that we've talked about doing for next year um, is at these meetups to have a, a sister meetup in, in the U.S., Europe, wherever uh, that, well, probably the U.S. because the time zone would be bad for Europe for this. But, but so if there's a meetup in the U.S. and it's, it's connected to the meetup that we have here, we could have it at the same time. And actually, the people at the meetup say in Nashville or Austin, they could, that, that $5 in sats, they could pay to the Salvadorian here. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we could, I mean, logistically it's a little bit challenging, but I think, you know, to really demonstrate that this isn't, this isn't just, you know, me scanning a QR code with somebody that's five feet away from me. This is someone in a different part of the world that sent it to you in a second. Yeah. Right. Like and, and you just downloaded that wallet. You didn't have to put your name in. You didn't have to 
ask anyone's permission. And look, somebody from a different part of the world just sent you money. I'll let you into a little secret. When I was testing the students, I my first student was a really cool young girl yeah. called Cindy. Do you know Cindy? No. Right, okay. And I thought, okay, you know, she's she's here, she's doing it right. And I thought, I asked her, I mean, I got someone to translate. I said, do you mind if I just take a photo of you and put it on Twitter, you know, to say, you know, congratulations. And I took a shot of her QR code for her Lightning wallet. Mm. And I just put on Twitter, look, anyone, anyone want to congratulate Cindy with a few sats? And unfortunately, um, the wallets we were using, Moon Wallet, will only take... Well, uh, apparently, one QR code would you could you could send as much uh, you know value there as you wanted. But in the case, I think a lot of people suddenly started to try and do it, and then you couldn't send anything. So, and we tried everything to sort it out. Yeah, it was a real shame because I I thought I I thought the same thing. I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun for her to just see how easy it is? Yeah, but the, in the end, the whole thing was a complete disaster. I had to delete the tweet, <laughs> but it was a real shame. The, because, um, but I like your idea. It's the same kind of thing, you know. But that that shows how early we are with Bitcoin, right? And and more specifically with Lightning, there are, you know, the way that many Lightning invoices work. So the one that you were using, it's it's one time use. Uh. But there there are, it seems like there's a movement towards more static addresses within lightning um there there's you know lightning's pretty young so there's a lot of a lot of development still going on i think the the trick to um lightning is i mean the, its biggest use case is small transactions and i think that that works with donation as well mm, yeah because every time like I often see people looking for donations on, you know, even you're on Twitter or whatever. There's, you know, every day there's somebody. And if I couldn't send a small amount, like I say I can send 50p, a pound, you know, a dollar, whatever. The fact that I can do that so easily with a QR code means I do it a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time I see something, I'm pretty almost certainly going to send something. And I think that's the way to, to work it, because if you get a thousand people all sending a dollar, that's a thousand dollars. And I think when, when people are expected to donate larger sums of money, they get t- tired of it much easier. Mm-hmm. And, and in places like this, it's even more um, easy and prominent um, because, you know, money goes further here. A dollar goes further here than it would back at home. So... You know, smaller donations matter more, mm-hmm. and I think it's. I think there's a huge kind of area of pa- patronization that will happen through Lightning Network because it's so easy to do it. Yeah, really easy. Imagine even trying to elicit money any other way. Mm-hmm. You either have to go through a platform, you like you know go you go fund me or something, which is a pain in the bum to be yeah. honest, <laughs> or send it to their bank details what they're going to give out their bank details on the right. phone it's like you know there's a real market for some things there where you can just bang 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 you know like and i i love seeing qr codes on on twitter because it's like yeah sure yeah. here's here's a thousand sats it's like 20 cents it doesn't matter mm-hmm. it's it's but when it but when you add it up you mm-hmm. know um so uh, um i forget what we we're talking about now <laughs> um I, let me see what i've got here oh yeah um so when you have these meetups do you, you said you're you're open to anyone. Do you get any old people coming? Yeah, we do. Uh, there's there's in fact um, I, I don't know his name. I, I'm terrible with names, but there's an older gentleman that came by himself one meetup, and you know he had never used Bitcoin before. He downloaded a wallet. He got his five dollars. He bought a drink and he went home. He has, I believe, never missed a meetup since. Uh, and, and he comes by himself and, you know, he'll often sit at a table with new people, make a couple of new friends for the night. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's the first person that comes to mind. But uh, there are a wide variety. It, it does skew on the younger side, but, but, but it, is, it is mixed. Does, do you think, because you live here, I suppose you've... Well, firstly, have you seen... What have you, changes have you seen since you first arrived to now? with regards to this kind of parallel financial system and that how, whether it's evolving, is it stagnating, is it moving? What, what's happening? So I think, I think there's a lot of critique about El Salvador um, because adoption isn't 100%. 
right? And and I think that's unrealistic to think just because it's legal tender, everyone will use it. Uh, just because everybody can use it, everyone will use it. That's that's a process. So what I think the most important thing to look at is the trend. So, uh, you know, August of last year when I arrived, El Zante, Bitcoin Beach was, was great. You know, you could use Bitcoin pretty easily there. Uh, although even there, it wasn't there. It was probably 50% of the businesses accepted Bitcoin some, somewhere around there, uh, which which was the highest concentration of uh, probably anywhere in the world. So it was quite high, but still it wasn't 100%. Um, but once you left there, so in San Salvador or, or other parts of the country, then there was nothing. It was, it was very, very close to zero, zero percent adoption. Uh, so now, even though there's still a long way to go. There's still, oftentimes when you go to a store now, it's not the smoothest process because they have to like, you know, go find a phone that they use to accept Bitcoin on because no one's paid in Bitcoin in like three days or something. Um, but that is, the, the trend is very, very clear that it is going in the right direction. Every day more people use Bitcoin. Every day, more people understand Bitcoin. So, like I mentioned before, initially Bitcoin was a was a bit more political than it is now. Uh, you know, not not Bitcoin itself, but how people perceived it. There was a very strong association with the government. So people that didn't like the government automatically didn't like Bitcoin, and that has, for the most part, gone away. Uh, people recognize Bitcoin as as existing independently from the government. Um, and that's that's a that's a positive step, right? To to recognize Bitcoin as as that's education, because that's a lack of education if people think that President Bukele is is you know writing code for Bitcoin or something, right? That that's a lack of education there. Uh, so and common sense. No. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I think I think education, and we are we do our best, and we are growing as fast as we can and i am so happy with you know having reached around 10,000 students at this point but 10,000 students well impressive that's a that's a it's a small minority of the total population but just because of other things just because of osmosis just because of other initiatives it does seem like people understand bitcoin in a way that is more advanced and when i say when I say that, I'm referring to people who I consider to be at zero still. Like that zero has kind of moved up a little bit. Some some of these silly assumptions that were there in the first weeks and months uh, that, you know, the only reason to use Bitcoin is for money laundering. Only, you know, all the drug dealers use Bitcoin. Um, that all, all these, I guess, assumptions, all this, all this misinformation that was out there in the beginning has not entirely but it's it's reduced quite a bit i think probably and uh, you know i i would imagine the new problems that you're facing are to do with the volatility of the price of bitcoin itself because um it's very easy to argue that el salvador's too early you know adopting bitcoin is great but in its volatile stage which it's obviously in its volatile stage. It's It's been in price discovery for 13 years already, and it's not yeah. about to stop. It's not about to plateau out. It's very easy to argue that that's the, the wrong time to implement it as, as, um, as legal tender. My experience when I came last time, and I, I, I still think this is the right solution, was that I was whenever I found someone that wasn't accepting Bitcoin... I would say to them, look, try a wallet like Strike, for example, because it was very easy to download. And um, just receive dollars from me. You know, I'm going to send you Bitcoin, but it doesn't really matter. It's using the Bitcoin network, mm -hmm. you'll receive dollars. And I would never advise a pupusa, sales, a pupusa lady to save Bitcoin unless she absolutely has a bunch of spare cash that she's mm -hmm. not going to touch for 10 years. Um, and I think probably... it. If I was against Bitcoin in this country, it's so easy to 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 have a go at it on an, on account of well, why would you use it when 
like if you'd have sold a pupusa for a dollar six months ago, it would now be worth 50 cents what you, what you sold it for. Mm-hmm. So is that something you come up, come across against or how do you deal with it yourselves? Yeah. Um, so we, as a point of principle, we do not talk about trade-in in our classes, uh, which, which is a question that comes up a lot. Like, Hey, can I buy, can I buy this coin? Cause I heard that I could double my money in a week or, or whatever. So we, we actively discourage that. Um, because we think, you know, I think we're all, we're all activists at heart, everybody involved with the project. Uh, we think that that misses the point. Like Bitcoin is, is a tool that could, that could empower individuals. And, and that's, that's the point that we want to drive home. Um, but it comes up a lot. It comes up a lot and it affects what we do a lot in a variety of ways. So, students are much less interested when the price is going down compared to when the price is going up. When the price is going up, everyone wants to learn about Bitcoin. When the price is going down, no one wants to learn about it. I think it's actually part of the adoption strategy. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's true. It's a lesson in itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, sorry to butt in, carry on. Yeah. But it's, but it's the same for, for funding, right? So donors and sponsors are generous when the price is going up and less so when the price is going down, which kind of works out because we have less students then. So, um, although that said, I said we have less students and that's actually not true. We, we, you know, every month, not literally every month, but the trend is that every month we have more students than, than the previous one. Um, which is doubly impressive considering that the price has been trending down for a year and we're still, you know, increasing the number of students, but, but all that is to say that the volatility definitely does impact what we do. We do talk about, um, you know, how you were saying that you could accept Bitcoin, but you don't have to be exposed to the volatility and that limits or, or that doesn't limit. It takes away the, the downside risk, but it also takes away the upside uh, potential there as well. So, you know, but, but we, we offer that to students as a way to mitigate volatility if they don't if if they don't want to be exposed to it i mean i i uh, like going back to my my farmer that i orange pilled recently she receives bitcoin in the beginning she received it to um pounds Mm -hmm. because she's running a business and i told her to I don't think it's a good way to orange peel someone by saying, oh, you need to get Bitcoin. I think she probably would have already, she would have stopped doing it if I'd have said that. That was three weeks ago. It's it's down 25, 22% since then. But in that time, she's already started asking me, how do I save Bitcoin? Mm. So the, 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 you know, she's, she's looking into Bitcoin. She's reading the Bitcoin standard. She's on podcasts Uh, now and all this kind of stuff. And I think that's the route. Yes. Yeah, so one one thing we'd like to say is that Bitcoin is our teacher. Uh, that's why we think the most important thing is to get people off of zero because then then they could go off on their own. And that's that's a really important thing about what we are doing and what we are trying to do with Me Premier Bitcoin is we put an extremely high value on all of our content being impartial and independent and not telling students what is right, what is wrong, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. We present information and they have to come to their own conclusions because that, that is, that's the point of all of it. If, if we're telling them what to do, like buy Bitcoin period, you know, do this, do that, then, then that, that really defeats the purpose because the ultimate mission is not for more people to have Bitcoin. For for us, the ultimate mission is to empower individuals. Bitcoin and Bitcoin education is a tool to make that happen. But the end goal is to create individuals that have self-sovereignty, that have personal responsibility, that have agency in their own lives. And it would be hypocritical and counterproductive for us to lead classes in a way that didn't fit into that ethos. So everything everything has to be, the, the point of all of this is that 
the individuals should have more control over their own lives. And, you know, the that necessarily means that we have to we have to give them that that freedom to to make their own decisions and learn their own lessons. Do you broach the subject at all of other cryptocurrencies? Is that something that you alert people to or is it just um I mean it, it's not in any of the materials that we have but that does come up as a as a question with with students like after the class or whatever they might ask about another another cryptocurrency and our standard answer is just that we only teach bitcoin and um that's 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 the one we recommend to people uh but definitely do your own research don't 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 believe the first person um i would uh, personally say that's probably the number one um problem in the in the bitcoin space if you want to call it that um and i don't know a single person who hasn't succumbed to that lesson at some point <laughs> uh, funny enough other than during during the pandemic we we um well, a friend of mine started a a, a Zoom call for noobs, okay. uh, and that we and uh, we ended up going every week. We're all still friends now, but funnily enough, that generation of Bitcoiners, who were the kind of twenty twenty ones, mm-hmm. listened to their fellow Bitcoiners, who said, "Just ignore all that stuff. Focus on this, and here is why this is important, and this is already enough." You don't even even if it don't you don't even have to ask the question are they scams are they not are they not? there's enough to be doing with Bitcoin because it's changing mm-hmm. the world yeah. and, and that and all the people on our Zoom call didn't dip their toes in the in, oh, really? in the shitcoin casino at all and still haven't huh. and it was purely I think because there was a new level of education out there mm-hmm. but the 2017 a 2018 lot every single person I know was yeah had a go. And, and learned that lesson and probably lost some money as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this this space, the broader space, not just Bitcoin, but but cryptocurrencies is a really fascinating window into human psychology. Right. Just like unit bias. Right. Just just the fact that there's yeah. the supply of of a given token is massive. You know, there's like nine trillion of them. So the price is a fraction of a cent. And that makes people think like oh it's worth less than a cent imagine it went to a dollar it could go it could go to a dollar but like no if it went to a dollar that would mean that it's worth more than like the market cap of gold or probably the sum total of all the wealth in existence ever normally yeah (laughs) but people see that low number and they're like oh room for growth well interestingly (laughs) i i had this thought recently um that when you when you study bitcoin it's such a concise succinct and beautiful invention in so many ways yes. you wonder how satoshi could have come up with all this stuff but he didn't seem to for he didn't seem to predict how bad the unit bias problem would be mm. and yeah. and that's true that's one i i because I, I put a message out the other day saying does anyone know if satoshi ever commented on unit bias and i think Gigi sent me a just one th- one bit from a Bitcoin talk forum where he'd actually talked about it, but it's oh, he it, did. Okay. yeah, but not much. Yeah, he didn't say anything. You know, like not, not of any. He didn't put as much weight on it as now. I think there's a lot of weight on it, which is why, like we were talking about Sats earlier, why everyone mm-hmm. should use Sats. Mm-hmm. I mean, if in a way, it would be might even be better if people just called it a Sat a Bitcoin or something. You know, mm-hmm. it would be confusing, but but. You know, like um, it's already confusing, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a it's a big deal the the yeah. unit bias thing. Yeah, for sure that 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 tricks a lot of people, um, but it, but it's also you know the other window into human psychology is greed, right? And and it's interesting because I think I think that's part of Bitcoin's design is it appeals to a large large number of people because it appeals to to their greed. Uh, I think a lot of people get into Bitcoin because they think they could make more dollars, they could make more money. Um, but once they're in there, not everyone, 
But many people will be like, oh, actually, no, Bitcoin's great for X and Y and Z. Like that has nothing to do with that. Uh, but but it's if you just talked about Bitcoin as freedom technology, Bitcoin as censorship resistant, Bitcoin as as uh, you know permissionless, and 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 all these great things that I think excite all of us as as Bitcoiners. Uh, we wouldn't convert a lot of people. That's just the reality. Not at all. But but like you said, I think that's a a phenomenal part of its design. It does um, turn certain incentives on their head. It allows you to greed to produce a positive outcome right which is a really phenomenal aspect of it yeah and it's another i mean there are so many movements which fall foul to this like the environmental movements one Mm -hmm. it's always telling you what you shouldn't do Mm -hmm. it's not allowing you to to just to do something it's like cut down on this don't use energy you know don't whereas bitcoin is saying yeah go for it be as greedy as you want but yeah. actually, it's a Trojan horse. <laughs> right, yeah. It, it's, it's really beautiful how the, how the incentive structure just flips because, you know, talking about living in an unsustainable world, we all, I, I feel like the whole world suffers from the tragedy of the commons uh, where, where, you know, we're all fishermen at a lake and we're all just catching as many fish as we can for ourselves but actually the lake is going to be empty and we're all actually hurting ourselves at the same time. And that's, that is so different from what Bitcoin does. Like the miner in Bitcoin is doing what's best for, for him or her. The, the merchant is doing what's best for him or her. Like everyone is doing what's best for him or her. And they actually strengthen each other, which is, which is really incredible. Like it, it's just, you know, you talked about Bitcoin um, aside from not anticipating unit bias, how everything just comes together. And it's, it's almost, I don't know, it's, it's almost hard to believe sometimes, like how, how everything is just working together mm-hmm. within the, within Bitcoin. Well, it, it was, a discovery yeah. is it, or an invention, whichever way you want to look at it. And I think a lot of people miss that fact. Yeah. Um, that's what makes it, that's what, how, how come it's so succinct yeah. for this time as well. I mean, it's the, it was the discovery of this age mm-hmm. that was necessary because of the state of the world. Mm-hmm. And it does, it turns all those things that are destroying the world at the moment on their heads to work, to get to work for the good of everyone, which yeah. is, it is quite an astonishing thing. Yeah. Although, um, like I say, it still doesn't answer the question, why didn't Satoshi <laughs> think about unit bias? Yeah. Unless this whole thing was just a fluke and it was like, yeah, he did invent... I know there were a few bugs at the start and it, it wasn't exactly mm-hmm. perfect, but there were a lot of things about it which um, he, um, he either could never have predicted right. or they or whoever it was, or it was just... It's something inherent in the system itself that means as long as you get the foundational block correct, then everything else works from that point onwards. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but just to play devil's advocate with Unibias, maybe maybe there is a benefit to it, right? Maybe it's maybe it's a filter because people. I, I think again, Bitcoin is a tool to empower individuals, and as part of that. It encourages individuals to think critically uh, and not to to just follow the herd or, or instinct, but to actually analyze things and, and come to intelligent decisions and conclusions. And unit bias doesn't fit that. You know, if 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 people that understand that sooner rather than later will benefit. People that understand that later that just make assumptions without actually looking into it. Like, well, why is this, why is this, you know, a hundredth of a penny? Oh, it's a hundredth of a penny because there's nine trillion of them. Not it's a hundredth of a penny because it's about to skyrocket up, right? That that second person hasn't done their due diligence and they will be punished for it. But what would be the disadvantage of those people coming into Bitcoin without getting unit bias? 
do you think that maybe because there's a, an adoption curve that should be adhered to, for example, maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of the same thing with the with the bull and bear cycles, which are quite extreme with Bitcoin. Um, it is hard to hard to learn in a bull market because everyone thinks that they're a genius because whatever they bought, whatever trade they made, whatever they did, they made a profit on it. In a bear market, a bear market is full of lessons. Uh, and, and I think those lessons are, are necessary. Like it is necessary to fail, right? We, we, I think the world that we live in today doesn't appreciate failure the way that it should. We avoid failure, right? We buy insurance. We, we, if we make a mistake with our, you know, with our bank card, then the bank will fix it. Like failure is something that we try very hard to avoid in this world. And that means that we don't learn those lessons that we should. And one of, one of the great things about Bitcoin is, I know this is a weird thing to say that it's a great thing, but, but, um, it teaches us lessons and, and those lessons are necessary, but those lessons are painful, right? But that's why we learn them, right? If there was no, if there was no negative side to that, then we wouldn't learn that lesson. I, I'm not sure how much you know about the free cities movement, but there is an underlying eth- ethos in that movement, which is somewhat similar in as much as, um, you would hope that we could try some new ways of living. Mm-hmm. We will may well easily fail, yep. uh, but it's important to be able to try them. Yep. So your average sort of free cities advocate will say, well, yeah, we need new versions of governance mm-hmm. and we need thousands of them. We need to be able to choose the ones we want and work out which ones are good and which ones are bad. And I, I mean, do you know much about free cities and... and Free jurisdictions. And I, I know the basics. And what's your opinion on 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 it? No, I'm well. The same thing, basically. That um, in order to succeed, we we often have to fail first, right? We have to experiment. If we're if we're afraid to experiment, then we have we have put arbitrary limits on our potential, uh, and so. Yeah, we definitely need to experiment in, in, in every direction. So in the direction of, of in this case, like governance and, and cities, that's that's so important. And and to bring it back to Bitcoin, for me, the most exciting innovation with Bitcoin is not money, it's power. It's a new way to think of our relationship to power and who wields it uh, and why they wield it. Well, that's interesting then. Um, uh, Based on what you know about the idea of free jurisdictions, do you think they're possible without Bitcoin? Mm. Let's say in in the long run. Are they possible? I don't know, but Bitcoin definitely helps. Uh, I mean, without without Bitcoin, then it's either they use the currency of that is you know the decisions are made elsewhere, um, or they make their own currency. But then that could be. Uh, I think that's vulnerable. Like if it's just one city with its own currency and it's in a hostile environment, like the 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 surrounding areas don't. Um, aren't supportive, then I think it's it's a vulnerability to have this, you know, s- smaller currency. But it's also a vulnerability to have a currency that is controlled by by a state, by another state. So Bitcoin seems to solve that. <laughs> it most certainly does for me, that's for sure. Um, something I was thinking about um, in your interactions with all your students and teachers and, El- you know, the Salvadorians, um, is there a sense amongst everyone about the scale, the the historical scale of Bitcoin? I mean, we all think we appreciate that it's it's a, an in- incredible thing. Does your does one of your students do they kind of get that 
in the same way that we might? For the most part, I'm going to say no. Uh, there are exceptions to that, and we do try to imbue that to them, which is, you know, at the graduation, that, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely something that, that we try to demonstrate, that this is something big, like you guys are part of something big here. Um, and some do get it, but they don't get it in the same way that we do, right? They don't get it in the, in the way that, like, you know, I, I quit my job, stopped, and, and picked up and, and started a new life here because I think that this is the most important place in the world right now. They don't, they don't have that deep of an appreciation <laughs> for it. Um, what not, was, what, not yet, not what yet. was your previous job, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, so I, I worked as a journalist before I came here. I actually covered Legal Tender Day for uh, BBC and Al Jazeera. Oh, right. Which was probably written, the last written time. Written or? Uh, so Al Jazeera written and BBC um, audio yeah. on the radio. Yeah. And how did you report on it? <laughs> well, that's an, it's an interesting, you know, I find, because I come from that world as well originally. Yeah. Okay. And there is a certain style to journalism in that world. And um, often it's not about coming back and saying, wow, everything's amazing and this is great. Yeah. No, it was, uh, I mean, and one of the reasons why I'm not a journalist now besides the, that I just don't have time for it is that I can't be, I can't be impartial, right? I definitely, I definitely <laughs> have an opinion on this. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the BBC are impartial. I, I've I, worked there I, myself. Well, <laughs> well, no, they're not, and and media generally isn't. But that's because I've strayed from the ideal, right? Like I, I think you know, and and, and the, well, we'll circle back to this. But I think there's an important point with with journalism. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like journalism, and I think that ear is misplaced because they don't like journalism. A lot of people in the world, and not just Bitcoiners, don't like journalism, but they don't like journalism. I think because it's strayed from the ideal quite far. So journalism has become like entertainment, right? It's just people, it's just what people want to hear, what's going to get clicks. And, and it's not, it's strayed quite far from the ideal. The ideal of journalism, what, it, what attracted me to that and is the same thing that attracts me to Bitcoin. When done correctly, it can act as a check against power. It's very infrequently done correctly, right? But but when it is done correctly, then it's a very powerful tool. Yeah, unfortunately, the current iteration of of journalism um, is stuck in a catch twenty two situation yeah. with power because yeah. if it decides to report against power, it loses access to power. Unfortunately, right. and that that will I don't not I mean my answer to that is parallel systems yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. obvious yeah. to everyone involved it's like you, you which is already happening in the media i mean the biggest media organizations now are the joe rogan podcast you right. know like blah 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 whatever um and and that's fa fabulous i love that i love mm -hmm. even that we're sitting in a you know we're someone somewhere in the world might be driving to the beach listening to us talk. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a, a market for every idea out there now. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but you're right. I mean, you, you did, you voted with your feet, didn't you? You, you, you quit a job <laughs> and uh, drew, drew up a syllabus and traveled uh, to Central America to sort of try it out. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm probably more surprised than anything that that it's that it succeeded right like i kind of intended not that i intended to but i acknowledged that there was a very good chance that it just wouldn't work out you know it wouldn't catch on it wouldn't uh we wouldn't find you know all the great salvadorians that we have found to to teach the students we wouldn't you know connect with donors we wouldn't uh, that that they would just meet these obstacles that we wouldn't be able to to surmount and and then you know hopefully I'd in my head I was like hopefully somebody else does something that that does catch on and maybe I could just help with that. Well, I mean, I'll say now congratulations for what, what you've achieved. I was at the you know awards or uh, the uh, graduation graduation ceremony 
the other days ago and it was so exciting to be there and to feel like I was part of it in a very small way so thanks for that um, before we finish though I, I, I've got to ask you one more question because uh, we have a, a small tradition on, on this show that we ask the same question of all our okay. um, guests I knew and I should have listened to an episode before <laughs> no no don't worry about it I already know what your answer is going to be I'm pretty okay. sure because you, you, get, you get a range of answers you either get really crazy out crazy ones or well let, I'll ask you the questions and you'll see so um <laughs> it's almost I could I already know your answer um I, I'd be keen to hear what you think it's if it matches up after it, it, you'll understand what I mean when I say it. okay so uh I want you to this is a hypothetical question um you are granted a sabbatical for one year during which um everything's paid for you don't have to worry about you know if you need a hotel somewhere if you need to travel somewhere it's all paid for it's all done for you no worries you just focus on what you want to do what do you do in that year oh i would change nothing I right mean, that's, that's, <laughs> exactly well there you go it's basically what <laughs> <laughs> i predicted that that's what i was gonna say <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so uh, nothing at all no i mean i you know, I think I think I kind of mentioned this on on Saturday. Um, I really feel like I'm living a dream here. This is. I, I am so overwhelmed at at how much support and how much how many people have have just joined and and helped and supported and and you know poured themselves into it. And I'm I have never felt more purpose in my life. I have never been more inspired by the people around me. Um, this is, it is, you know, sometimes uh, I wish I could sleep more and have, have time for other things, but um, but now there's, there's I'm, I'm, I'm where I wanna be. Well, I'm, uh, congratulations on that. I'm very happy for you. I think it's a great initiative and it seems to be changing lives on the, on the ground. What more could you want? So thanks for spending some time with us and, and I've really enjoyed this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.